Now that we have been through the various plasters and techniques used for closing up a defect, we'll move now to the use of local flaps in closing defects in the head and neck. There are various ways to describe a flap and several proposed classifications. Conveniently, they can all be combined into a system with sub items uh, starting with a C. The first C is the circulation. Uh, like it can be a direct vessel uh, going to the flap, like in axial flaps, or indirectly through musculocutaneous branches, like in random flaps, followed by the composition, uh, which refers to whether you are using a full thickness skinned flap or partial thickness, including fascia, or muscle, or even bone into your flap. The third C refers to conditioning of the flap, either by delaying to improve its vascularity or expanding the tissue using tissue expansion. The construction of the flap itself refers to the flow of the vascular flow, whether through a single pedicle or bipedicle conformation of the flap into a tube or combining flaps. And contiguity refers to whether you are uh, the distance between the flap itself and the defect, whether this is direct, uh, local, regional, or distant, or even a free flap. Um, the contour is one important aspect of classification because it refers to the method used to transfer the flap into the defect, uh, either through advancement of the flap in a linear movement or rotation around the pivot, uh, like in rotation uh, flaps and so on. This last C, uh, referring to the contour of the flap, uh, forms the basis of a common system of uh, classification of the flaps into advancement and pivotal flaps. Advancement flaps are those flaps that are moved in the one linear direction without any rotation or lateral movements like in single pedicle advancement flaps or bipedicle or a V to Y flaps. But when the flaps are rotated around a pivotal point, uh, they can either be a rotation, simple rotation flaps. When the flap is directly rotated into the defect with no intervening tissues, or if the flaps are rotated into the defect over a partial intervening tissues, they are called transpositioning, like in Z flaps, for example, or uh, if they are crossing over an intact bridge of intact tissues, they are called interpolated flaps. We'll come to this in a second. We'll go through the general classification of the flaps first before moving to uh, one flap at a time. The first group is the advancement flaps group including a single unipedical advancement flap or a bipedical two advancement flaps meeting in the midline or the island flap, a V to Y type of uh, flaps. We also have examples from O to L advancement flap and the east-west advancement flap. And then we'll move to the rotation flaps, either single rotation like the dorsal nasal flap or the scalp flap or the cheek rotation flap or a double rotation like the one usually used in the scalp, the O to Z type of uh, plastic. But when the flaps have to cross an intervening uh, tissues in order to lie in its new position, they are called transpositioning flaps. Like in this example, you would have to uh, cross, you have to raise up the whole of the flap and cross over a partial intervening tissue in order to uh, reconstruct this flap. Examples are the bilobed flaps and the cheek as well. And then to interpolated flaps in which the flap has to cross over an intact bridge of a skin to reach its destination. Example is this uh, paramedian forehead flap. The origin is in the forehead centered over the supratrochlear artery. It has to cross over intact skin to reach its destination to cover up a defect in the nose. And the flap will be sutured over the defect 
and left over until new vascularization takes place and then at a second stage it will be released from its origin and this area will be repaired the single pedicle advancement flap here used to cover a rectangular type of a defect but it can be circular or triangular if if needed you will consider first which side you would want to base the flap on you can base it superiorly inferiorly or medially but obviously laterally here is the best option then you will have to consider the lines of the flap to be parallel to relaxed skin tension lines and the length of the flap to be two to one for example at the length to the breadth and then you would draw up the burrows triangles at the base of the flap this should be about half the breadth of the defect and once the burrows triangles are removed the flap can be slided in a linear movement to fill up the defect and sutured first at the leading edge the apices of the leading edge and then the area of the barrel triangles where you have the maximum tension followed by suturing of the remaining lateral parts on the flap defects can have various forms and various shapes in this example it's a circular defect lying below the lower eyelid and beside the nose for this the uh, design of the flap will be modified in order to have incisions parallel to the relaxed skin tension lines so you have the upper incision parallel to the lower eyelid and the lower incision parallel to the nasolabial fold they are no longer parallel to each other and you don't have to be parallel to each other you have a wide base to supply the uh, length of the flap after mobilization and you can also consider where to have your burrows triangle in order to remove any excess or redundant tissue and in this example you can have the burrows triangle and the lower incision rather than the upper incision this is to illustrate the planning and the technique of the edge plasty of the bilateral advancement flaps if you have a, a rectangular or a square defect in the midline in the forehead or the lips and the lesion is excised and you have all the parallel lines parallel to the relaxed skin tension lines on both sides and you've marked the burrows triangles toward the base of the flap on the two sides and these are excised to ease the mobilization of the flaps from lateral to medial to meet up and the defect um, and once they reach the midline they can uh, meet their the other flap and the midline keeping the symmetry and it's not too difficult to close up the uh, burrows triangles after this and this is the final outcome resembling an edge another advancement flap the vy or the island flap if you have a, a defect with a diameter of an x you can mark a triangular flap with a, a leading edge of an x and a length of 1.5 to 2 x's the lesion is now removed and the a completely separated piece of skin here that is detached from all its surroundings is advanced into the defect pedicled only on its subcutaneous attachment this is where the blood supply is coming from once in place it will be sutured the leading edge will be sutured in place and then you will mark a suture at the apex of the flap this is where most of the tension is flap dimensions the leading edge of the triangular flap should be equal to the diameter of the defect that's an x the length of the flap should be between 1.5 and 2 x's and the angle at the apex should be about 30 degrees to prevent a dog ear formation and if there isn't enough tissue on one side of the defect or if there isn't enough tissue laxity you can have the flaps from both sides meeting up particularly in the midline 
uh, where uh, symmetry is required. The VY plasty, as opposed to the VY flap, is a technique of suturing a V-shaped incisions or uh, wounds into a Y configuration. You need that sometimes if you have a large defect where you would expect too much tension in the center or would you expect some uh, dog ear deformity at the edges. You need here a release incision. And if you choose to have a V-shaped release incision of this shape, uh, not reaching up to the defect itself, it stops here, then you can advance that piece of skin with no much tension to affect primary closure. You'll be left with the V-shaped uh, release incision that is going to be sutured like a Y. We now plan a release incision for this wound. And if we choose to have it like a V-shaped, you extend the incision only halfway to the uh, uh, edge of the defect itself. You don't go all the way up, you end up here. Once you have the design in place, you can now incise the release incision and undermine widely. Now that should make it much easier for the wound edges to meet up with no much tension and no dog ears deformity. Once this is done and you've closed the primary wound, you are left with the V-shaped incision that's now closed like a Y. This is the uh, V to Y plus thing. We move now to rotation flaps. It starts by drawing a triangle around a circular or a square lesion. The base of the triangle should be as close as possible to the lesion itself, and the width of the base should be about approximately the diameter of the lesion. Then you draw an isosceles triangle with the angle at the apex equal about 30, and the length of the um, triangle should be about 2 to 2.5 the uh, the width of the base. And once the triangle is uh, the the base of the triangle is then extended like a curvy linear line, about five to six times uh, the diameter of the lesion, five to six times axis. And lesion with the triangle are excised. Curvy linear line is incised now and it's ready to be mobilized, but you see a dog ear forming at the base, a burrows triangle, equilateral triangle with half X in dimension will be created, and now you can mobilize the flap to fill up the defect. One alternative to excising burrows triangles, if you don't want to discard with viable tissue, is to have a back cut at the other end of the curvilinear line. So rather than excising the barrel triangle, you make a back cut here, making sure that you are not compromising the blood supply of the flap that goes from the base. Once you have the back cut in place, the flap can be mobilized easier into the defect itself. The defect that's going to be formed by mobilizing the flap away from the back cut would usually be closed in a V to Y type of reconstruction. In the case of bilateral rotation flaps, um, recruited from the either sides of the defect, but going in opposite directions, you will end up with an O to Z type of reconstruction. So you'll draw the two flaps on the opposite directions on both sides, and because you are using two flaps rather than one, you can have the curvilinear line extending about three times to 2.5 times the diameter of the defect. Once the uh, flaps are created and elevated, they can now be mobilized to meet in the midline of the defect 
and once this is sutured you will see a Z rather than an uh, O. So that's the, the final closure. Moving now to transposition flaps and taking the rhomboid transposition flaps first. These are a family, a group of uh, flaps uh, with the original description of Limburg and some other variants. A circular or a square lesion uh, is changed in uh, configuration to a rhombic defect. This rhombic defect has the characters of, have, of being equilateral parallelogram. The angle at the apex is 60 and the angle at the other side is 120. So the short diameter is equal to the size of the uh, rhombic as well. And when extended to the outside, equal, si equal size again, and then a line is drawn parallel to one of the sides of the parallelogram, and these two lines would also be equal to the size of the parallelogram. This uh, lesion will be removed and the flap will fill up the defect. And you can have a double Limburg and a triple Limburg. We have the modification with differential flaps, the Quabas modification, the double Quaba modification, and then the Webster modification or the uh, diamond flap modification. Starting with the original Limburg flap, this is the rhombic configuration, equilateral parallelogram. Then we extend the short diagonal to the outside, equal length, and drop a line parallel to one of the sides of the parallelogram. All these lines are now equal. The lesion itself is excised, the flap is mobilized and transposed into the defect. This is where you have maximum tension between the angle of the flap and the parallelogram. And the leading edge is now secured inside and you have the sides also and now sutured. And you can have a double Limburg if the region is too big or if it is uh, oblong in shape, you'd now draw a parallelogram with a length to breadth ratio of two to one can be divided into two rhombics and then you extend the short diameter to the outside as usual and have a line parallel to one of the sides of the parallelogram do the same on the other side and now you have two uh, flaps two limburg flaps on the sides the lesion itself is excised and then the two uh, flaps are transposed to meet up in the middle of the defect and the secondary defects are closed primarily. Needed, you can have a triple limber to fill up a very large defect. Here we don't draw parallelograms outside the lesion, we draw them inside. We draw three small parallelograms inside the lesion by having three diameters, diagonals uh, intersecting at 60 degrees, then we extend the short diagonal of each to the outside, equal length, and drop a line parallel to the parallelogram, equal length again, and then you would have now three flaps going in the same direction around the circular defect, which is now excised, and the flaps would be released and undermined and transposed to fill up the defect and meet there, and you would end up having this configuration as like a Mercedes-Benz type of a mark. With a deformental flap, you can work with rhomboids with angles different from the classic 60 degrees and 120 degrees. You can work with 30 degrees and 150 degrees rhomboids. You first extend the short diagonal to the outside, draw a line, and then extend one of the sides of the rhomboid and draw another line and bisect the angle here and that's the first limb and drop from there a line parallel to the long diagonal of the rhomboid and that would be the flap the deformental flap the lesion is then excised and the flap can be transposed to fill up the primary defect and it would be easier now to 
close the secondary defect because the angle is narrower and you have less of a problem with a dog ear deformity at the angle of the scar. The diamond flap modification was suggested to reduce the amount of healthy tissues excised uh, around a circular defect to get the uh, rhomboid shape. This piece of healthy tissue can be preserved and now the shape of the defect would not be a rhomboid, it would look more like a diamond shape type of a defect. Equally, the flap designed to fill up this defect can be modified because it no longer has to fill up the whole of the rhomboid uh, by reducing the amount of the flap in this area. Um, so it, it is a tissue sparing technique. You would draw the rhomboid shape as usual, but this time rather than you would rather than excising these pieces of skin at the top, you would try to preserve this. Now extend the short diagonal and one of the sides to get the deformental flap design. And now the lesion is excised, sparing some part, some part of the tissues here at the top. This is a diamond shaped lesion and a diamond shaped defect. And you can use this to reduce the amount of the uh, tissues that need to be transferred to fill up the defect as well. And the secondary defect can be closed easier like in a straight line and you have filled up the primary defect with the diamond shape uh, flap. The Webster flap introduced two modifications to the original description of the rhomboid flaps. The first is to have an M plasty at one of the acute angles of the rhomboid, and this would entail preserving a piece of healthy tissue that would have otherwise been lost. The second modification is to have the angle at the apex of the deformental flap uh, 30 degrees, and this very acute angle would help uh, in uh, transposing the flap into uh, the primary defect and also helps in closing up the secondary defect with uh, less tension and less likelihood of having um, a dog ear deformity. So you start by drawing up the rhomboid shape and you will then mark the flap by extending the short diagonal and one of the sides of the, of the rhomboid bisecting the angle. Now, rather than having a line parallel to the long diameter, you draw 30 degrees and get a line equal in length to the rhomboids. So this angle is 30. Now you mark the M plasty at the apex of the rhomboid on one of the short of the acute angles, and now you can preserve that small piece of healthy tissue. Once the defect and the flaps are marked, you excise the lesion, sparing that piece of healthy tissue here to help in the reconstruction. Lesion is removed and the flap with the acute angle is raised and transposed into the primary defect. And now you have this small piece of skin helping in closing up the uh, primary defect. And it's also much easier to close up the secondary defect as well because of the acute angle here. Another variant is the square peg into the round hole variant described by Quaba. Here we don't draw any parallelograms outside the circular defect. 
we just extend one of the diameters two thirds of the way up and from at 60 degrees angle and equal length limb two thirds of an X again and here you are you've got a small uh, parallelogram that is going to be uh, transposed into the circular defect hence the name this is where you have most of the attention the suture between the base of the flap and the defect and once you have the leading edge of the parallelogram in place you can uh, secure uh, by suturing the uh, lateral limbs as well and this is the area that would need attention the maximum tension and the prime and the secondary side can now be closed as well the bilobed flaps were probably first introduced more than 100 years ago. Since then, the technique and the design has been modified in several ways, and the original design is rarely used nowadays. But it introduced the general principle of utilizing a double transposition flaps. If there is a defect that requires a local flap, and the site of the local flap cannot be closed primarily because there is no enough tissue or no enough tissue elasticity around to close the site you can utilize a second flap to close up the site of the first flap and then try and close the uh, site of the second flap primarily and in this way you can utilize tissues by recruiting it from areas relatively far from the original defect. Zitelli proposed to reduce the arc of rotation from 180 degrees between the primary defect and the secondary lobe to something between 90 and 110 degrees. So the arc of rotation between the defect and the first lobe is reduced to 45 degrees rather than 90 and the same applies to the angle of rotation between the first and the second lobes of the flap. And this reduces reduced the tension on the tip of the flap and reduced the shortening effect and the potential retraction of important landmarks. He also suggested to have the second lobe as an elliptical or a triangular in shape to ease the primary closure of the uh, defect. In Zetelli's technique, you start by marking a line um, from the center of the circular defect, extending to the outside with a length equal to the radius of the circular defect, and then draw a 90 degrees line and bisect it so that you have a 40 degrees angle between these two lines. And then you draw two arcs, the first from the center of the defect, the other from the uh, circumference of the defect. And these two arcs would have a radius of twice the radius of the defect or three times the radius of the defect for the outer arc. And then you draw um, the primary flap around the first line and the secondary flap around the second line. And these two flaps should be almost equal in size to the primary defect. And then you elongate the secondary uh, flap so to, as to close it primarily, and you also excise a small piece of uh, skin at the base of the primary defect. Now, the two flaps can be uh, transposed easier uh, into the primary defect and the secondary defect and by removing this small piece of skin you can close up the uh, secondary defect in a straight line. A further modification to the Zetelli's uh, design was then proposed. You still extend a line from the center of the defect to the outside and this line would be measuring twice the radius of the defect. It would be equal to almost the diameter of the defect. And then you draw either a 90 degrees or a 110 degrees, bisect these, so you get a 45 degrees each or a 50 degrees if required. 
and then draw two arcs from the center of the defect. The first arc would intercept with the uh, 45 degrees in the center of the primary flap and the second will be in the center of the secondary flap. Now, the further modification was to elongate the primary flap about 10 to 20 percent, uh, more than the size of the original defect, to avoid uh, creating any uh, shortening or retraction due to the uh, pivotal rotation. And the same applies to the secondary defect, which can be a little bit, the width can be a little bit reduced, uh, almost to about 60 or 70 percent of the width of the first flap, but it would be uh, stretched in length for more than 30 percent or so. This increase in length between the two lobes of the flap would cancel out any shortening effects. We proceed with three versatile distant flaps used in head and neck reconstruction. The paramedian forehead flap, an interpolated type of flap used in total reconstruction of the nose, the deltopectoral skin flap, and the pectoralis major muscle flap in head and neck reconstruction, particularly in relation to selfage surgery. The paramedian forehead flap is a good example of interpolated flaps. It's considered the workhorse for reconstruction of major nasal defects because it provides a significant amount of skin and tissues for replacement of the uh, nasal defect. This type of skin, the color, the texture and the thickness is quite similar to the nasal skin. It has a reliable Vascularity, it's based on the supratrochlear artery, which has a consistent entrance into the flap pedicle. And the flap pedicle itself can be narrowed to as little as 15 millimeters. And the flap can extend up to the hairline and sometimes beyond that to provide adequate cover for the nasal defect. So this is marking of the uh, midline of the face and 17 millimeters to 22 millimeters of this you would expect to find the pedicle of the artery a centimeter above the medial end of the eyebrow and then vertical course of the artery towards the hairline and you take the template and place it just beneath the hairline to mark the uh, area of the flap that's going to cover the nasal defect. At this level, the superior part of the flap, the dissection is subcutaneous, but in the, uh, as the dissection proceeds toward the eyebrow, you would need to get into the um, um, subperiosteal level because the artery lies underneath the frontalis muscle in there. That's the cephalic part of the uh, flap incised and ready to rotate medially to cover up the defect. And you would leave the pedicle attached to the flap for about three or two, four weeks until the flap established its blood supply from its recipient area. After three or four weeks from the first stage operation, the area of the flap that is now attached to the nasal defect would have received new vascularization from the recipient area and the pedicle of the flap can be divided and released to return back to its normal position. So that's releasing of the pedicle of the flap, leaving 
the distal end of the flap uh, to fill up the nasal defect and the released part of the pedicle can now be returned to its original position. Another versatile distant flap used in the head and neck surgery is the pectoralis major muscle flap plus or minus the delto pectoral skin flap particularly in relation to selfish surgery where it made such a significant impact particularly if it is used routinely and electively in the resection procedure the procedure usually starts by harvesting the delto pectoral flap and then retracting it to expose the muscle and identifying the inferior and lateral border of the muscle and this would allow good visualization of the vascular uh, pedicle of the muscle flap that should be kept secured all through the steps. The muscle flap is used now with, to cover up the irradiated field. The skin flap can be used primarily or can be returned back to position to be used if it is needed, if there is any skin failure or any pharyngocutaneous fistulas. The procedure starts with designing and harvesting of the deltopectral skin flap. It's a large skin flap extending from the line of the clavicle to the line of the anterior axillary fold. Uh, it has a rich and a reliable blood supply from the perforators of the internal mammary artery that gets into the uh, flap at the medial ends of the upper three or four intercostal uh, spaces here and this provides excellent blood supply to the flap up to the level of the deltopectoral groove here you can add additionally a small part of skin over the deltoid muscle as an additional random flap to the axial part of the flap we usually raise up the flap in the primary operation and occasionally use it in the neck in most cases the flap is returned back to its original position at the end of the procedure after harvesting and mobilizing the muscle flap in order to delay this uh, skin flap for subsequent use if any pharyngocutaneous fistulas develop in the neck and this improves its blood supply by the process of delaying and then you can use the flap if required to uh, fill up a small defect of a fistula in the neck or most of the neck if there is any tissue damage or sometimes also parts of the face under the level of the zygomatic arch. The large and well vascularized deltopectral skin flap has a large arc of rotation as the pivotal point is actually in the upper border of the flap and not the lower border. So it can reach almost anywhere in the neck and in the lower part of the face. It retracts from side to side and not from end to end. Once the deltopectral skin flap is elevated, it would be retracted medially towards its uh, vascular supply and wrapped in moist and warm towels over the sternum. This would leave the pectoralis major completely exposed. So large mus muscles with three heads, a small portion coming from the medial end of the clavicle. This is the clavicular part of the muscle. The major part of the muscle arises from the sternum and the upper six ribs. This is the major bulk of the muscle and a small abdominal part arises from the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle. The muscle is now well exposed and will identify the inferior and lateral border of the muscle. This is where we would start the dissection and elevation of the muscle to work in the subpectoral plane which is a safe fairly avascular plane and where we would identify early the pedicle the vascular pedicle of the muscle that runs from here
the major blood supply to the pectoralis major muscle and it's flat comes from the acromiothoracic artery which is a branch of the first part of the axillary artery the uh, artery together with two veins runs on the deep surface of the muscle along um, almost its entire course and branches from there medially and laterally this is the major blood supply to the flap and should be kept under clear vision during the whole procedure the muscle also receives additional blood supply medially and laterally medially from the uh, intercostal branches and the perforator of the internal mammary artery this can bleed profusely while the muscle is mobilized and laterally from branches of the lateral thoracic artery again a branch of the axillary artery but in its second uh, part and these two additional blood uh, supply should be identified and divided and secured to mobilize the muscle in order to rotate it into the neck the major blood supply would remain the pectoral branch of the acromiothoracic artery and its veins once the lateral and inferior attachments of the uh, pectoralis major muscles are divided you can identify the subpectoral plane the plane between the deep surface of the muscle and the pectoralis minor muscle and this is a fairly avascular plane and blunt dissection can be carried out to develop this plane well and then you will identify the vascular pedicle of the pectoral branch very clearly dissection then proceeds first laterally and then medially alternating between the two to detach the muscle and allow its rotation so we divide the lateral attachment and then the medial attachment alternating between the two always keeping the pectoral branch and its veins in direct vision elevation and retraction of the deltopectoral skin flap as an initial step allows for the wide exposure of the pectoralis major muscle flap particularly its inferior and lateral border and creation of the subpectoral plane where you can identify the vascular pedicle and from there once the vascular pedicle is in clear view the dissection proceeds upwards detaching the muscle flap laterally first and then turning to the medial end taking care to ligate and secure all the extra blood supply to the muscle from the lateral thoracic artery laterally and the perforators of the internal mammary and the anterior intercostal arteries uh, medially uh, this would give more arc of rotation to the muscle freeing it laterally and medial and medially incrementally and so long as the main blood supply of the muscle flap the pectoral branch is in clear vision all through you should be safe it's also very important to keep the uh, veins away from any uh, damage or injury thermal or or direct traumatic injury now the muscle is freed and can be rotated up to cover any part in the neck and if you do this electively you can either use the deltopectoral skin flap as well or return back the deltopectoral skin flap to be delayed this is the muscle now muscle flap covering the exposed carotid sheath with a very well vascularized bulky muscle flap with or without the extra deltopectoral skin flap by this we come to the end of this presentation on the flaps in head and neck reconstruction Salam alaikum.